Hello everyone. Section 7 deals with impulse functions. Um, you may have never heard of what an impulse function is, um, and if you have, you may not quite understand where it comes from, so let me just start off by trying to derive to where this comes from. Okay, so let's consider a function that looks like this for a second. Let's call this point minus epsilon. Let's call this point plus epsilon. And let's say it has a height of 1 over 2 epsilon. Okay, and it looks like this. It's just a rectangle. Like that. Okay. Now, hopefully you can see that the area of this rectangle is equal to 1, right? Its length is 2 epsilon, and its width is 1 over 2 epsilon. So if you multiply those two together, you're going to get 1, right? Now, what happens if we start shrinking epsilon? Well, probably something like this, right? 1 over 2 epsilon would increase, right? Because it's inversely proportional to epsilon. And so if we keep going, if we get very dangerously close, then, yeah, it even goes off the screen, right? Does not do that. That's not what I mean. <laughs> yeah, one note. One note clearly cannot handle um, how dramatic I'm trying to make this, but that's fine. Let's say it does that, sure. But you see the pattern, right? Now, as you get into more advanced mathematics, you'll start to wonder, okay, what if we start pushing epsilon to its extremes, right? What if epsilon starts going to zero? And that's really what is the introduction to the Dirac delta function, which is the impulse function. If we let epsilon go to zero, this peak that we were creating here, right, should eventually just go to infinity, right? And I'll put a little arrow. That's just like to signify it's just all the way up there. Um, and this is what's known as the unit impulse. So I write it over here as uh, Dirac delta. It's also called Dirac delta function. But um, I guess I'll just say this now. It's not really a function. Um, and you'll see why. But they call it Dirac delta function anyway. And it's written as follows. It has a little uh, sigma, subscript c of t, or uh, sigma t minus c. Again, they're the same thing. And then I really should put quotation marks here for infinity. This is what just it theoretically should be. Again, we can't really reach it. And that's what it's equal to at whatever time c that you indicated at. Or and it's equal to zero for anywhere else. And so you might be wondering what the applications are for this, and I'll, I can tell you right now from experience, this is used a lot in digital signal processing, also known as DSP. And uh, modeling highly erratic physical models, something that um, its velocity, and I believe things like momentum and acceleration, they don't um, exactly correspond to one another. Like you can have a unit impulse of moving a mass, just striking it immediately, and you need to model it with a direct delta. So it can lead to some pretty interesting physics as well. Great, let's go over these quick little properties. Um, if you integrate this thing uh, from A to B, so from zero to infinity, as long as the direct delta is, uh, like the impulse is being uh, set between that A and B, when you integrate it, it's equal to one, right? Because remember from our previous, our, our little derivation, uh, the area under that thing is always one. So that's where that comes from. And if you don't reach it, if C isn't within A to B, then it's just zero, right? Because everywhere else, this uh, function, in quotation marks function, is equal to zero. Now, then the next property, because uh, we're in the Laplace chapter, right, is what's Laplace transform of this? So this is what I believe is called the sifting property, where you're basically just picking out the value of the, the kernel or whatever other function you're multiplying inside the integral by. In this case, it's the function e to minus st, right? And we, we've seen that all the time in the Laplace transform. So what it does is it picks out the point e to the minus sc, and it says that's the Laplace transform. Now notice something. This is the only transform that we've done so far where it does not, like it doesn't have a over s. It doesn't have a, a power of s that's greater in the denominator than the numerator, which should kind of, hopefully by now, ring some bells in your head that this is probably not a function, which it's not, clearly. 
And so if you want to take the direct delta of Laplace with direct delta that starts at t equals zero, um, you'll get one. And that's something that we just haven't seen yet, right? Everything has been over s, over s squared, over s squared plus a squared, um, stuff like that. So again, this is not a function because of the Laplace, right? That should be good evidence for that. So I wrote fun fact. Um, this is something that I don't think many professors stress, but for some reason, whenever I show, show it in recitation, like my students freak out. And so I feel like you guys deserve that as well. So let me go ahead and pose this for you. Rattle your brain a bit over this. So this is your good old friend, the unit step, right? And this is u0 of t, sure, right? It can also be uc of t, it doesn't matter. Now, notice something. What if we take the derivative of this thing? You might be and uh, you might be saying like, oh, I don't know how to take derivative of this because it doesn't make too much sense. Well, let's just look at each individual part, right? Uh, the left hand side, as in what's left of t equals zero, is all zero. So the derivative between there is zero, right? From t not equal to zero and higher, it's also equal to zero, right? So from here to all the way over here, infinity, whatever, it's also equal to zero. But then what happens at zero? There seems to be a jump discontinuity, which would imply basically infinite slope, right? So we can model it as that little arrow. And so therefore, what is this saying? Therefore, Okay, so the derivative of the unit step at whatever time that you in, uh, you started at is equal to the Dirac delta at that same unit in the sense of distributions. Again, Dirac delta is not a function, which is why I have to have to put in that constraint of in in terms of the of distributions because this doesn't work as um, as regular functions that you've seen before. But I mean, for our purposes, this is this is a correct statement. So yeah, I thought thought it would be cool sharing that with you guys. Anyway, let's get to solving IVPs, which is the whole point of this, right? And this one isn't too bad. I just want to illustrate a couple things. So we have y prime prime plus 4y is equal to 2 direct delta t minus pi over 4. Really, I should have wrote direct delta pi over 4t, but, you know, again, same thing. Uh, homogeneous initial conditions with y0 and y prime of 0 is equal to 0. So we're not going to have any minus s y of 0 minus y prime of 0. So we know that when we take Laplace of this guy, we're only going to get s squared y of s, right? And when we take Laplace of this guy, we're going to get a plus 4 y of s because of this, okay? And then this will equal 2 times, and then we saw that the Laplace transform of something shifted by whatever time c is e to the minus cs. That's it. So this is going to be e to the minus pi over 4s. Okay. Um, do what you always do, right? You go ahead and make it just strictly a function of y of s. And this is going to be equal to 2 e to the minus pi over 4s. Right? And then you're just going to divide by s squared plus 4. Right? OK, as always, uh, don't worry too much about the e to the minus cs part of things. Clearly, when you take the inverse Laplace of this, that looks a lot like sine of 2t. Right? And it is. Except now we have an attached e to the minus pi over 4 times s which I said in the last video as well, that just means that you shift your t by pi over 4, and then you attach a unit impulse, Not sorry, not unit impulse, unit step at pi over 4. So what this becomes now is sine of 2t, except our t is now t minus pi over 4. Again, that 4 is not, no good. Times u pi over 4t. And that would be the solution to that IVP. 
that's it. So, uh, as you can see, clearly, direct delta and unit step functions are intimately related. They kind of go with each other. When you're going to take the, uh, what do you call this, the Laplace transform of IVPs of something on the right-hand side that's direct delta, more than likely you're going to end up with a unit step function in the end. So just kind of keep that in mind. See how all this is kind of tying together. See, have a feel for what is related to each other, what yields certain things, and you know, you'll be good to go. So up next is convolution integrals, and then we're done with Math 2552. So see you then.